It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. I've talked about why one of the decisions you could make that will help your wallet is to buy Series I savings bonds. I'm going to tell you the latest you need to know and important when you should buy them. Also, the car industry is being turned upside down and Ford is getting on board with something that has dealers furious, which means you should be thrilled. I'm going to tell you what's going on and I want to tell you in that, I want to talk about in today's market, if you are forced to buy a new car, if that's what happens right now, how you go about that process. So back in the spring, I set off basically a firestorm trying to get you to buy Series I savings bonds. And you're allowed to buy 10,000 of these each year per person in your family. And there's another wrinkle that people seldom use where you can have your tax refund go to buy more than that $10,000 cap up to another 5,000. Well, Series I savings bonds are something that is somewhat complicated in that what it does is instead of falling behind the rate of inflation, you get the current rate of inflation. So when we go back to the spring, the rate was set for a six-month period at 9.6%. And it's about to go through a reset. And it may not feel like it in our wallets, but inflation has been steadily coming down overall when you look month by month. And it's still way too high. But the reset is going to be somewhere high fives to low sixes, somewhere in that range coming up in November. However, if you have heard me talk about the series eyes, maybe even tried to buy them and you had a hard time doing it earlier this year because the U.S. Treasury Department wasn't ready for the demand and their system kept crashing and all that and you just forgot about it. If you do so in the next few weeks and don't wait till the last week of October, you can still get the 9.6% rate for the next six months. And then you'll get whatever that reset is, upper fives to low sixes, for the six months after that. You have to hold the Series I savings bonds for a year minimum. Uh, you hold them for just a year. You forfeit the last 90 days interest. So you'd want to buy these with the intention of holding longer. You hold them for five years, then you don't forfeit anything by cashing them in. And all they do is they get you the rate of inflation. So the reason this is significant is that I-bonds used to give you a bonus plus the rate of inflation. But they're so popular now with buyers, all you get is the rate of inflation. But if you think about, you walk into uh, Wells Fargo or Bank of America or Chase or Citibank, you're going to get one one hundredth of one percent on your savings. Seriously, one one hundredth of one percent. It's pretty insanely ridiculous, right? So then you have something here. The Feds are selling direct at nine point six percent for now. That's a little better than one one hundredth of one percent. So if you've got money sitting, creature of habit, sitting in a savings account. It, one of these giant monster mega banks, you need to get that money out. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that more sometime soon as well, about how much you're poisoning your pocketbook by being with the giant monster mega banks or the next tier known as the super regionals. But if you want to know how to buy these series eyes, go to savingsbonds.gov. And you're allowed to own them up to 30 years. But the big imperative right now is that savings rates, even if you shop around, aren't close to what you can earn on these Series I's. 
And that's why for the foreseeable future, this is a great place to stash at least up to that $10,000 in cash in each family member's name. And you'll see how to go through all the confusing detail of doing so at savingsbonds.gov. And Krista has some questions for me. And Krista, it's great to have you today. The Series I savings bonds uh, back in the spring were a huge source of confusion. Yes, so many questions sent in to us and then to our Consumer Action Center. So um, this first question I have right now is from Wendy in New York. I'm listening to you speak about insurance for a dorm room, and this one is personal for my family. My daughter accidentally tripped the sprinkler system at her college and caused $20,000 in damage to her possessions mm -hmm. and those of dozens of other students, laptops, et cetera. The college so it wasn't she had $20,000 no, in the dorm room. No. It was collectively on the dorm floor. Uh, the college wanted to have her work for them unpaid for the next three years to pay off the loan. It was an accident, and now my daughter was on the brink of indentured servitude. Anyway, I wanted to share that my homeowner's insurance covered the loss. And we had some other people write in about this as well, saying that we're sort of discounting how much equipment that people have now, phones and laptops and other things that may be worth a lot of money. Yeah, there are so many pieces of electronics in a dorm room. I mean, it's a whole different era. And I really got, oh, and by the way, the homeowner's insurance covering, that was a great save. Mm -hmm. um, what I talked about before was buying renter's insurance typically starts at $5 a month to have it for a dorm room or an apartment. So when I went to college, I went with uh, what was called a footlocker. Do you know what that is? Yes. A like a, a chest. Yeah, a giant like box. And what did I have in it? Clothes and a typewriter. And a toothbrush. Oh, yes, yes. I had, <laughs> I had a tooth, <laughs> toothbrush. Um, but that was all that was involved with going to college. And it was a manual typewriter. Wow. Nobody knows what that means, do yes, they? Yes, they do. And uh, maybe they've seen it in like uh, the Smithsonian or something, a typewriter. But there was no uh, equipment. Like I remember when my oldest went to college, it was when people first started taking TVs to their dorm rooms. And I remember they had a dumpster outside just for TV boxes that people had taken to college. And I think how different that was because um, when I went to school, after you dodged the dinosaurs going to class, there was one black and white TV per floor in the dorm. Hmm. That was all there was. I, I joke about the toothbrush, by the way, because my son once went to sleepaway camp for two weeks and I sent him with an unopened toothbrush. And, it came and when back I picked unopened? him up, it was unopened. Okay. okay, so people who only had girls would not be able to relate to this. Boys, when they're younger, will never change their underwear. Oh, God. They wear the same underwear. I'm telling you, preteen boys, a lot of times, I mean, one pair of underwear a year seems to work for yeah. them. Well, thank goodness now, like, he won't eat something after he's brushed his teeth in the morning. Okay, Garth <laughs> in California says, in this day and age of digital footprints and tracking, I find myself reluctant to make donations to very many organizations because my information may be sold and I will be flooded with requests for more money. I have two questions. One, how do I make an anonymous donation to a charity? And two, how do I make an anonymous donation to a political group? All right, let's deal with them in reverse order. So never, ever, ever, if you want to not be bombarded with emails and solicitations in the mail and all the rest, never give money to a political candidate's campaign directly or to the political party that you are interested in. Give instead to these, what are called dark money groups, okay. where people are kept, well, that's, I mean, if you want to remain anonymous, that's what you do. If you, if you watch TV during the campaigns going on right now, and you see all these ads that are just big fat lies, and then at the end, it will say something weird like, this is blah, blah, blah group. Right. It's like a nothing name. Those are dark money groups 
that the Supreme Court allowed to operate in a decision, I think, 10 years ago. And so you can give money to those, give it anonymously, and not have to worry about being bombarded by candidates or political parties. On the charities, charities, any donation you give, that's why they'll try to even get you to give a dollar or five dollars, is to get a qualified lead, to get somebody on mailing list, to get somebody who they can try to get to be a regular donor. If you want to avoid that, you have to do something uh, simple like go buy a money order and send a money order to a charity as a donation with no information about how to reach you or contact you. But then you don't get the tax deduction, right? No, you, oh, that is true. But if you give a donation below a couple hundred bucks, your word is good enough for the IRS. So if you're giving smaller donations, you can do that and still take a deduction. Waco in Oklahoma says, I'm 40 and I'm building a house. Completed value will be $650,000. I need to refinance to a permanent loan in January. We started construction before all of the craziness and materials skyrocketing and the interest rates exploding. Would it be wiser to take a five or seven one arm over a conventional 30 year loan? Do you see interest rates declining in the next five to seven years? So it's very difficult to predict the movement of interest rates. So what I'm going to tell you is more a best guess than uh, you can't take what I'm going to tell you to the bank. So I don't know how long, Waco, you want to stay in that home. If your ownership cycle is less than 10 years, you could do a 7-1 arm. I'd be comfortable with that. 5-1 um, arm, unless you expect your ownership cycle to be relatively short, uh, becomes pretty risky. The movement of interest rates likely is going to go steadily up until the back of inflation is broken or until we go into a recession. One of the things economists and finance people look at is the interest rate on two-year treasuries that's like a CD for rich people from the federal government, now higher than the interest rate on 10-year uh, treasuries. When that happens, that means the long-term trend is expected to be lower interest rates, which means, again, nobody can guarantee this, but the odds favor that we're going to go through a cycle of higher rates, and then once the back of inflation is truly broken, rates will come down. Also, the effort to try to break inflation is going to lead to a slower economy and likely a shallow recession, possibly a deeper one, but not as likely. The combination of breaking the back of inflation and having a slower economy should lead to lower interest rates. So this is a gamble. It's not an extreme gamble, but there is always a gamble when you don't lock in long-term rates. That's why so many people are doing what you're talking about right now. They're taking the, the risk on of only locking in rates for five or seven years and then taking their chances that in the next five to seven years, rates will go down enough to make locking in on a long-term a good move then that would be tough now. So I'm going to give you that as a tentative kind of feel about how this would play and know that things can happen in the world we don't expect, we don't anticipate, that could mean that interest rates don't come back down, but the odds do lean towards it being more favorable to do exactly what you're considering. Could I have been more wishy-washy on that? <laughs> Well, it, the answer is it depends, right? Well, the answer is it's more likely than not going to play that way, that he'll benefit from doing the 5-1 or 7-1. But there is risk involved with doing it. How's that a way Sounds to good. summarize it? So I love capitalism. I love the free market. I love the efficiency it can create. And right now, the marketplace is speaking hard trying to get an industry stuck in old ways to change itself and that is the car buying business 
I want to talk to you about that straight ahead. There's a huge fight going on behind the scenes that affects your wallet and mine so much. And it's how you're going to buy vehicles in the future if you're a new vehicle buyer. The dealer networks around the country have used their power in individual states through their state automobile dealers associations to fight free and open competition. The dealers have fought these new automakers that generally are electric vehicle makers from being able to sell cars because they refuse to use traditional dealers that are an inefficiency in the market that the marketplace does not need. Dealers are very, very powerful contributors to members of their state legislatures, and they take care of those state legislatures well, and they get this anti-competitive kind of stuff where I remember years ago when the traditional automakers tried to sell vehicles direct to the public, the dealers got that shot down. And so it adds thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to the cost of a vehicle that you buy because this is something that may have made sense even a generation ago, but now it's just an interference in the market. And the way people buy vehicles now has changed so much. Do you know typical automaker now, 50% of their vehicles people are buying online. The dealer's not even doing anything. The customer is creating the order, equipping the vehicle how they want and all the rest. Well, because of this antiquated dealer thing, the vehicle ends up being sent to a dealer, and then the dealers are ripping off the buyer, adding all kinds of extra costs because of the shortages of vehicles in the marketplace. It is an incredible anti-competitive abuse of the free market to great, 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 great harm to you as a consumer. Well, Ford has had enough. And Ford now has told their dealers that if they're still going to be the ones selling vehicles, that they can no longer play that game of you agreed to a price to buy a vehicle, but we're not going to follow it. We're just going to charge you whatever we want once the vehicle comes in. The new rules, transparent, non-negotiable pricing. And the dealers are going crazy. They hate this. Plus, Ford's requiring all kinds of things for dealers to do to really show they have value to the marketplace and things they're going to have to do to decide if they're going to want various levels of certification as a Ford dealer. The reality is this anti-competitive, anti-consumer, antiquated, terrible, terrible thing of you being forced to buy from a dealer who gets in the middle of a transaction between you and the manufacturer that anti-competitive garbage needs to go away. It's wrong. And to think that dealers like, okay, manufacturers who want to sell a vehicle in a state are being blocked, who've never had dealers before, they're these new brands, from being able to sell vehicles in a lot of states. The automakers are going so far, the automakers, dealers in some states, are trying to outlaw a vehicle being repaired in a state where a manufacturer doesn't have a dealer. That is bonkers. And it's one of those things that makes people cynical about government and politicians and these businesses that claim they believe in free enterprise and the free market are lying because this kind of practice shows they don't believe in the free market. As for you, when you're trying to buy a vehicle today, the pressures of the shortages will, are from different manufacturers are gradually easing. This is going to get steadily better over the months ahead as the supply chain shortages have continued to ease. 
and we're going to be back to a more normal market. And then you as the consumer, if you choose to use your power that is available to you online, are going to be able to decide who you're going to buy from and what's the best bargain you're going to be able to find out there for the vehicle you want to buy. And the dealers ultimately can slow down the free market, but they can't stop it. And for you, knowledge is power. Never, ever, ever, not ever go to a dealer except to take delivery of that new vehicle. You do everything online. When you go to the dealer, you transfer the power from you to them with the vehicle that you want to buy. By the way, you own car dealerships? I know I've infuriated you. Go to Clark.com slash Clark Stinks so I can hear what you have to say, the part of the story, the part of the picture that you feel I'm missing. Krista? Can't wait to read those. All right. <laughs> yeah, those are always fun when I say something about car dealers, aren't they? AJ in Georgia says, should I buy an extended warranty on a new Toyota RAV4 hybrid? My worries are related to the cost of replacing the battery. Not at all. I, that should not be a reason for you, AJ, to look at buying an extended warranty. The warranties that Toyota and the others offer on the hybrid battery systems are so good. And the in Toyota's case in particular, the hybrid technology has been around since 1997. Wow, 25 years now. And so they have not only gone from being a, a lab rat kind of experiment to being mainstream, they've continually refined them and the reliability is extraordinary. Do not buy an extended warranty on a Toyota because the general trend with Toyotas, most Toyota models, is that they are very reliable vehicles. Okay, and Scott in California says, just before COVID, we were shopping for a travel trailer for my family of four. We held off buying not knowing what the future economy would be like with COVID. Now we regret not making the purchase and have been waiting for prices to come down. What are you seeing in the used and new RV and travel trailer market? Do you think prices will come down soon? My kids are getting older, and it would be great to have a few years of camping trips together without breaking the bank for a camper. Sure. So you got hit by a perfect storm, Scott. You had people who were using travel trailers uh, and bought them in huge numbers and RVs of various types in 20 and 21, particularly in 20 because they wanted to vacation in as safe a way as they could during COVID spread before vaccines. And uh, you have people who started being able to do remote work, who have been traveling around by RV or travel trailer and working from wherever on the road where they've been able to find a good internet connection. So it's created an insane wave of demand. That's the second time I've said the word insane, I think. Mm -hmm the last few minutes anyway um it's created a big wave of demand for rvs and travel trailers and so this will soften as the economy slows one of anything that is a want to instead of a have to slows down during a slower economy so i think you're going to find that as we move out of 22 into 23, the odds really favor the cost of these things, particularly in the used market, softening. The other thing is that a lot of people now who work in office type jobs are now being ordered back to the office and off the road. And those travel trailers and RVs that they've been enjoying living in, they're now going to have to just park them and that's going to create opportunity for you as well. In the meantime, in the short time, you could take some shorter trips in rental RVs as or a way longer. to get out and about. They Sorry. don't have to be short. People are renting them for long periods of time. True, but I'm, I'm talking about versus the cycle of owning, owning one it, for yeah. a long time or a lifetime. You could rent and wait for the prices to become more reasonable 
for you to buy one. And there's um, RVShare.com. There's several RV rental sites. So maybe people going back to work will also put them on the rental market. Um, Annette in Alabama says, with all the artificial intel- intelligence and self-driving cars and semis, can they be programmed to spot and avoid deer or any animal entering the road? This time of year in rural areas, they're very deadly. That, and that, that's a great question. And there are automakers that now make uh, technologies that uh, either help you avoid running into someone on a bike, a pedestrian, an animal running across the road, or at least alert you to it. And I've even seen during football, that's when I got to see commercials, is now football's back in place. There are even commercials for these kind of technologies on vehicles. So this is something that will become more and more common as uh, we talked a lot in prior years about uh, autonomous vehicles, cars that would just drive themselves. But what's actually happening in the marketplace is a big emphasis on driver assistance, like things that will uh, drive your vehicle for you on a freeway, but not necessarily on city streets. Things that will help you keep from uh, coming out of your lane. Things that will automatically emergency brake if there's a vehicle in front of you. And technology that will spot any type of pedestrian or animal in the road in front of you. So yes, that is clearly something that is today available and will be completely common in the future. So be safe out there. And yes, I've hit two deer in my life. You ever hit a deer? I've come close. I've had them jump out in front of me, but thank goodness avoided it. Yeah, it's uh, when I was in high school, uh, one of our beloved teachers at the high school was on vacation with his wife and young child, and they hit a deer, and all three of them died. Oh, gosh. And that's awful. I remember that so well to this moment. And so when I'm driving, particularly during the time of year that deer are much more present on the road out and about, I'm so, so conscious of them when I'm driving down the road Mm -hmm. because it can be so dangerous and sadly even potentially deadly. Mm -hmm. So sorry to end on that note here. I want to tell you the I-bonds I was talking about earlier in this podcast, they're so confusing to people as they go through the process of buying them. And I want to tell you we are equipped to provide you free one-on-one advice with the I-bonds, if you're having trouble with understanding them or purchasing them, or any consumer issue or question or problem you've got, I want you to know for just short of 30 years, we've been providing one-on-one free advice from our staff and volunteers and the Team Clark Consumer Action Center. And you can talk with one of our Team Clark members. It's 636-49-CLARK. Remember, this is free, one-on-one available to you from 10 in the morning Eastern time zone till 4 in the afternoon Eastern time zone, Monday through Friday, except for holidays. Have a wonderful day.